So they voted to extend emergency provisions in the Coronavirus Act until October, despite the opposition. Several Tory backbenchers and Liberal Democrats as well were on the scene too. Happy to report, yes, they are still there. The vote means that emergency powers, like the ability of police to force people to receive coronavirus tests, will remain in law. Uh, the debate came as Matt Hancock admitted he cannot guarantee the legislation will not be renewed in six months. So Graham Brady is the chairman of the 1922 committee and one of the Tories who voted against the government on this. So Graham, good afternoon to you. Um, and I was just saying there, I, I perhaps have even taken some of your own words in my, my introduction there. But I mean, just give us your reasons, uh, if you would, for voting against the government. Well, these are extreme powers, and they were introduced in an emergency a year ago. Uh, lots of us were uneasy about that then, but accepted it because it just seemed like a reasonable balance that the government wanted a three-week shutdown, concerned about the rate of infection, concerned about the NHS not being able to cope. Nobody envisaged that it was going to be uh, in place for 15 months, uh, as we're, we're now uh, seeing with the lockdown measures, and the Coronavirus Act in place for at least 18 months. Mm. So, you know, I think um, not only is it about the power of the government to shut down businesses and tell people to stay at home, it's so fundamental. It, it's about whether people are allowed to see their children or their grandchildren, of whether course. people can travel outside the country to go and visit relatives there, uh, whether you're allowed to start a relationship with somebody. We can't let government control these things. Why do you think 408, uh, or the majority of 408, 484 of your uh, your peers across the across the house from all parties d d thought differently to this? Because I'm I'm struggling to see why more people didn't join. I mean, it's 76. It was you know a good innings by you guys, but clearly not enough. Yeah, I think you've always got to add two tellers, so probably 78. True, in, uh, true. In, in true. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, take all uh, the numbers. But, uh, absolutely, <laughs> um, and you know I think. It's also important to, to note there are a lot of people who voted with their party whip, uh, but with a very heavy heart. And certainly, uh, as I said in my speech in the chamber yesterday, at the point I spoke, I was the 31st MP to speak in the debate, and uh, only two uh, backbench speeches had given unreserved support to what the government was doing. So even amongst those who reluctantly voted with the government, there were a lot of concerns being raised. And I spoke to one Labour MP after the debate who said, well spoken, uh, and very sympathetic to the arguments you're putting forward. So I think we are making progress. One of the problems, of course, is that the way this is done, uh, it's a bit like a, a, a um, frog that they say you can boil a frog yeah. in a pan of water and it won't jump out. It's done on a gradual basis. So they take the powers uh, for an emergency uh, for three weeks. Then it turns into three months. Then after six months, oh, it's got to be renewed again because we're not sure what's going to happen. Now they're talking about the possibility of variants in the future that might be resistant to vaccines. Mm. Well, if you're going to take away fundamental liberties on the basis of things that might or might not happen, then you've got yourself into quite a serious hole. So we would forever uh, be living under a system that could close your business if it decided to without so much as a comment at the dispatch box because the law is already in place? Well, I think that's the, the danger that, as I said in the comments yesterday, I think the danger of normalising yeah. uh, an extreme policy. And I, I heard your comments about the BBC. I was some of the BBC interviewers that I've dealt with. Uh, they seem to think that anybody who thinks the lockdown should ever end uh, is a dangerous criminal. Um, you know, actually, you know, they have to understand they are the extremists who are saying uh, lockdown for a very long period of time, take away people's control over their own lives. It's, uh, it's people on my side of the argument are the moderates sure. who are saying, let's try to restore as much freedom as we safely can. And realistically, though, Graham, although you're absolutely spot on, and I think most of our listeners get exactly where you're coming from on this, but and it's right that we have parliamentarians like yourself and your colleagues who do keep the executive in check in this kind of way and vote against uh, these sort of measures. But did, did, so there's a precedent there and a point that needs to be highlighted and shown and 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 the House can see that there are or there is disquiet in some quarters. But actually, when you strip it all away, do you really think come October that there will be an extension again? 
I, I think there's a real danger of it. Uh, this uh, and you know, one of the things we really need to come to terms with: COVID is now uh, almost certainly an endemic virus. Uh, like flu, it will come back, uh, and probably it'll come back on a seasonal basis. So we probably will see COVID again uh, next winter. And we, I say that's an argument for finding an equilibrium, finding a way in which we can live with COVID and make some sensible mitigation to try to keep people mm. safer. There's no way we can simply shut the country down for four months every, every yeah. year. Uh, so once you accept that, the current policy is entirely irrational. And we were told, uh, of course. It is, but it is, it's the pattern of, of events we've seen so far. Indeed. And just, just a final point, Graham, I mean, we, we were told that, you know, the vaccine was the answer. And once that was up and running, then we could begin the process of easing the lockdown. Now, the most vulnerable group, nine out of 10 of that group have now been vaccinated and, and many more in groups below that, too. So where, where does that leave the, the theory that the vaccination was the answer to easing the lockdown? Well, exactly. And that, of course, that really important milestone was reached the middle of February uh, that we'd vaccinated yeah. effectively all of the most vulnerable groups, reducing the risk at that point of serious illness uh, by about 90 percent. As you say, it's now gone further than that. Uh, so we're, we're pretty much at the point where there is a 99 percent reduction in the risk of serious illness or death from COVID. We're seeing that coming through so strongly in the data. Uh, all of the metrics are moving in the right direction. We've seen children go back to school and all of the hundreds of thousands of millions of tests that are being done in secondary schools, uh, we're not seeing high levels of COVID infection. And yet, uh, the answer is to unlock as slowly as possible and to extend the powers uh, for another six months up to October. Uh, I think that you know the danger is that if people can't see a benefit uh, arising from having the vaccine, uh, then people are going to be less inclined to, to yeah. have the Good. vaccine. Good it point. ought to be the thing that, that drives people to go and uh, get jabbed in, in their arm, uh, the knowledge that it's going to help them to get back to normality and, and freedom and control over their own lives. Spot on. Graham, thank you, Sir Graham Brady, MP. He's chairman, of course, of the 1922 committee. He was one of the 70-odd MPs that voted against the government yesterday. Clearly not enough to make a difference. Did it put the frighteners in any shape or form? Does it set a precedent? Will the government think twice before extending powers? What will be their reasons for extending it again? Do you believe that we are likely to see these laws gone by October? 0344 499 1000. 